Hello everyone, this is Mike from Library of Dyslexia and today we're going to be going over a reread of Rene Descartes' first and second meditations and so it should be a good one. First meditation, what can be called into doubt? Some years ago I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I had accepted as true in my childhood and by the highly doubtful nature of the whole edifice that I had subsequently based on them. I realized that it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely and start again right from the foundations if I wanted to establish anything at all in the sciences that was stable and likely to last. But the task looked like an enormous one, and I began to wait until I should reach a mature enough age to ensure that no subsequent time of life would be more suitable for tackling such inquiries. This led me to put the project off for so long that I would now be to blame if by pondering over it any further, I wasted time still left for carrying it out. So today I have expressly rid my mind of all worries and arranged for myself a clear stretch of free time. I am here quite alone, and at last I will devote myself sincerely and without reservation to the general demolition of my opinions. But to accomplish this, it will not be necessary for me to show that all my opinions are false, which is something I could perhaps never manage. Reason now leads me to think that I should hold back my scent from opinions which are not completely certain and indubitable just as carefully as I do from those which are patently false. So for the purpose of rejecting all my opinions, it will be enough if I find in each of them at least some reason for doubt. And to do this, I will not need to run through all of them individually, which would be an endless task. Once the foundations of a building are undermined, anything built on them collapses of its own accord. So I will go straight for the basic principles on which all my former beliefs rested. Whatever I have up till now accepted as most true, I have acquired either from the senses or through the senses. But from time to time, I have found that the senses deceive, and it is prudent never to trust completely those who have deceived us even once. Yet although the senses occasionally deceive us with respect to objects which are very small or in the distance, there are many other beliefs about which doubt is quite impossible, even though they are derived from the senses. For example, that I am here, sitting by the fire, wearing a winter dressing gown, holding this piece of paper in my hands, and so on. Again, how could it be denied that these hands or this whole body are mine, unless perhaps I were to liken myself to madmen whose brains are so damaged by the persistent vapors of melancholia that they firmly maintain they are kings when they are paupers, or say they are dressed in purple when they are naked, or that their heads are made of earthenware, or that they are pumpkins, or made of glass. But such people are insane, and I would be thought equally mad if I took anything from them as a model for myself. A brilliant piece of reasoning, as if I were not a man who sleeps at night and regularly has all the same experiences while asleep as mad men do when awake. Indeed, sometimes even more improbable ones. How often, asleep at night, am I convinced of just such familiar events that I'm here in my dressing gown sitting by the fire when, in fact, I'm lying undressed in bed? Yet at the moment my eyes are certainly wide awake when I look at this piece of paper. I shake my head and it is not asleep. As I stretch out and feel my hand, I do so deliberately and I know what I am doing. All this would not happen with such distinctness to someone asleep indeed, as if I did not remember other occasions when I have been tricked by exactly similar thoughts while asleep. As I think about this more carefully, I see plainly that there are never any sure signs by means of which being awake can be distinguished from being asleep. The result is that I begin to feel dazed. This very feeling only reinforces the notion that I may be asleep. Suppose then that I am dreaming and that these particulars, that my eyes are open, that I am moving my head and stretching out my hands, are not true. Perhaps indeed I do not even have such hands or such a body at all. Nevertheless, it must surely be admitted that the visions which come in sleep are like paintings, which must have been fashioned in the likeness of things that are real, and hence that at least these general kinds of things, eyes, head, hands, and the body as a whole, are things which are not imaginary, but are real and exist. For even when painters try to create sirens and satyrs with the most extraordinary bodies, they cannot give them natures which are new in all respects. They simply jumble up the limbs of different animals. Or perhaps if they manage to think up something so new that nothing remotely similar has ever before been seen, something which is therefore completely fictitious and unreal. At least the colors used in the composition must be real. By similar reasoning, although these general kind of things, eyes, heads, hands, and so on, could be imaginary, it must at least be admitted that certain others, even simpler and more universal things, are real. These are, as it were, the real colors from which we form all the images of things, whether true or false, that occur in our thought. 
This class appears to include corporeal nature in general and its extension, the shape of extended things, the quantity or size and number of these things, the place in which they may exist, the time through which they may endure, and so on. So a reasonable conclusion from this might be that physics, astronomy, medicine, and all other disciplines which depend on the study of composite things are doubtful, while arithmetic, geometry, and other subjects of this kind which deal only with the simplest and most general things, regardless of whether they really exist in nature or not, contain something certain and indubitable. For whether I am awake or asleep, two and three added together are five, and a square has no more than four sides. It seems impossible that such transparent truth should incur any suspicion of being false. And yet firmly rooted in my mind is the long-standing opinion that there is an omnipotent God who made me the kind of creature that I am. How do I know that he has not brought it about that there is no earth, no sky, no extended thing, no shape, no size, no place, while at the same time ensuring all these things appear to me to exist just as they do now? What is more, just as I consider that others sometimes go astray in cases where they think they have the most perfect knowledge, how do I know that God has not brought it about that I too go wrong every time I add two and three or count the sides of a square or in some even simpler matter, if that is imaginable. But perhaps God would not have allowed me to be deceived in this way, since he is said to be supremely good. But if it were inconsistent with his goodness to have created me such that I am deceived all the time, it would seem equally foreign to his goodness to allow me to be deceived even occasionally, yet this last assertion cannot be made. Perhaps there may be some who would prefer to deny the existence of so powerful a God rather than believe that everything else is uncertain. Let us not argue with them, but grant them that everything said about God is a fiction. According to their supposition, then, I have arrived at my present state by fate or chance, or a continuous chain of events, or by some other means, yet since deception and error seem to be imperfections, the less powerful they make my original cause, the more likely it is that I am so imperfect as to be deceived all the time. I have no answer to these arguments, but I am finally compelled to admit that there is not one of my former beliefs about which a doubt may not properly be raised. And this is not a flippant or ill-considered conclusion, but is based on powerful and well-thought-out reasons. So in the future I must withhold my assent from these former beliefs just as carefully as I would from obvious falsehoods if I want to discover any certainty. But it is not enough merely to have noticed this. I must make an effort to remember it. My habitual opinions keep coming back, and despite my wishes, they capture my belief which is, as it were, bound over to them as a result of long occupation and the law of custom. I shall never get out of the habit of confidently assenting to these opinions, so long as I suppose them to be what in fact they are, namely highly probable opinions. Opinions which, despite the fact that they are in a sense doubtful, as has just been shown, it is still much more reasonable to believe than to deny. In view of this, I think it will be a good plan to turn my will in completely the opposite direction and deceive myself by pretending for a time that these former opinions are utterly false and imaginary. I shall do this until the weight of preconceived opinion is counterbalanced and the distorting influence of habit no longer prevents my judgment from perceiving things correctly. In the meantime, I know that no danger or error will result from my plan and that I cannot possibly go too far in my distrustful attitude. This is because the task now in hand does not involve action but merely the acquisition of knowledge. I will suppose, therefore, that not God, who is supremely good and the source of truth, but rather some malicious demon of the utmost power and cunning has employed all his energies in order to deceive me. I shall think that the sky, the air, the earth, the colors, shapes, sounds, and all external things are merely the delusions of dreams which he has devised to ensnare my judgment. I shall consider myself as not having hands or eyes or flesh or blood or senses, but as falsely believing that I have all these things, I shall stubbornly and firmly persist in this meditation, and even if it's not in my power to know any truth, I shall at least do what is in my power, that is, resolutely guard against assenting to any falsehoods, so that the deceiver, however powerful and cunning he may be, will be unable to impose on me in the slightest degree. But this is an arduous undertaking. And a kind of laziness brings me back to normal life. I am like a prisoner who is enjoying imaginary freedom while asleep. As he begins to suspect that he is asleep, he dreads being woken up and goes along with a pleasant illusion as long as he can. In the same way, I happily slide back into my old opinions and dread being shaken out of them for fear that my peaceful sleep may be followed by hard labor when I wake and that I shall have to toil not in the light but amid the inextricable darkness of the problem that I have now raised. All right, that's it for the first meditation. We're going to come back with the second meditation. 
Um, it's a six part series. I'm going to cover at least two of them. If people request more, I might cover more. But anyways, that's it. Uh, feel free to email any topic requests or questions to libraryofdyslexia at gmail.com. Be happy to get a, I would be happy to get back to you with whatever questions you have. Thank you and you have a good day. Bye. And this is not flipping. <laughs> The 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 the